Yes. What time is your Dohr prayers there? Yes. <laughs> Dohr prayer, what time is it? Uh, uh, 10 minutes again, okay? Oh, okay, great. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. So I'm sure they're still uh, praying and uh, getting ready. Yes. Mm. So once it's uh, ready, just you let me know while I'm doing other work. Huh? Okay. Um, I, I will be I will be on, but once it's uh, yes. something exactly. Okay. Okay.
Assalamualaikum, sudah, sudah oke okay, Pak, sudah, 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 sudah. Assalamualaikum, Mr. Mustafa. Waalaikumsalam, yes. Oke, okay. uh, we can start our class. Oke, okay, can you give me two, three minutes? I'll just change my position, then I'll call you, know, just two minutes. Yes. Okay. Halo, oke, okay. ayo. Oke, okay. okay. yes, yes. oke. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala asrafil anbiya wal mursalin Wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in The Honorable Dr. Mustafa Umar Muhammad And all of participants The economic departments uh, Today we will help the scores The topic is uh, Perfect competitions in Islamic perspective yeah. uh, Uh, we have uh, 
one hours and 30 minutes and maybe uh, one hour to present for Mr. Mustafa and the press will be discuss yeah, about this topic. Okay, the time for yours, Dr. Mustafa Umar Muhammad. Okay, okay. okay. great. <coughs> Okay, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. My dear brothers and sisters and those who are following me online. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the chairperson, uh, Dr. Imam, brother Imam, whom I have known for a long time. And he is our Imam, uh, even in this session. And also Dr. Dimas and also the Dean of uh, APF and the directors uh, for this invitation for me to share my, my views uh, on the topic given, which is related to market structure. And I believe the focus will be, like uh, Dr. Imam says, on uh, perfect competition. So let me begin by sharing my uh, slides. Um, I'll try to make it big. Okay, so inshallah I'll be looking at this uh, uh, market uh, structure from an Islamic uh, perspective. And so these are some of the outcome within this uh, uh, one hour that we'll be going through. We'll look at the learning outcome. Uh, we'll give some short introduction and we'll look at the market structures which have been uh, uh, said earlier. And then the role of the government within the structure and some of the market values which we think um, uh, our Islamic uh, uh, principles advise us to follow. So, we expect that at the end of this session, um, our dear students should be able to explain the perspective of market structure. And they should be able to explain the role of the government in an Islamic economic system. And they should be able to explain the behavior of some of the uh, economic agents uh, uh, within those discussion. Now, in our introduction, these are some very, very important points that would like to make it as a contour to give a scope of our discussion. Uh, we know that market is one of uh, the mechanism, and this is very important. Market is a mechanism in Islam for the allocation of uh, resources and distribution of income and wealth. It is not an ideology. Uh, so, why do I emphasize on this word ideology? Because today we hear the word market economy. We hear the word planned economy. Um, so when we hear the word market economy, which basically refers to capitalism, it's an ideology. Ideology in the sense that this market like uh, uh, Allah Raham, who Professor Garudi, a French Muslim scholar says uh, that uh, two things have become faith now. It has become like deen, like religion. And that is the market and science. Huh? Market and science have become like deen. I see people admit, should I admit here? I... Oh, okay. It keeps on popping to me here, admit, admit. I think they have, who is the host? You're the host, right? Brother Imam, you're the host, isn't it? Okay, okay. Good, good. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, in Islam, a market is not an ideology. It's one of the mechanisms. We know that in the early days, there are a lot of other mechanisms for allocating uh, resources and income and wealth. Uh, things like Beitul Mal uh, was used uh, and things uh, like uh, Zaka institutions work of institutions, all those were mechanism. But of course, uh, uh, the bigger one is the market. So market is one of the mechanism for allocating these resources. It's not an ideology. Uh, the second thing which we would like to say here is that 
though market is not an ideology in Islam, Islam is pro-trade, is pro-market. Uh, it encourages market participation. Our Prophet ﷺ was a trader. He participated in the market. Uh, during the Hijrah from Mecca to Medina, uh, we saw many of the Sahaba, they lost a lot of properties. They were persecuted. When they came to al Madina, their brothers, the Ansar, wanted to give them a lot of things free, uh, even to share with them their you know, houses, share everything. But most of them will say, Dalluni ila suq. Show me where the market is. Uh, and so, you know, to them, market is everything where we have to participate. So it's within us, it's our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, this is the third point is very important that today there is largely an absence of Islamic market. And this word is very important because we are operating on conventional rules. We are operating on uh, conventional structures, conventional regulation. And this reminds me of um, one of our great scholar in Irti, Dr. Sami Suwailam, once he was saying something very nice. <clears throat> that today, if um, a Muslim depositor comes to an uh, Islamic bank, you know, he or she wants to deposit money. And then the Islamic banker says, you know, um, we are going to give you a product called Mubaraba. Okay. Then uh, the depositor will ask, what is Mubaraba? He says, in Mubaraba, you will deposit your money. You are the capital owner. You own the capital. And we banks, bankers, we are mudarib. We will invest your money as investors, managers. Uh, if there is profit, we will share. But if there's loss, you will take the burden of the loss. Hmm. Then uh, Dr. Soelam Asi says, if you tell depositors this, uh, imagine how many depositors will come to Islamic banks. Hmm. Why? Because their mindset is still a conventional market. So there is no ready-made Islamic market. I mean, it's a very interesting thing, which may apply to a lot of things that we see around us, uh, which later we'll discuss. But to a great extent, you find the Islamic market existing in our so-called informal markets. Huh? And we find this a lot in Indonesia, in Malaysia, uh, when you go to this Kadai Kadai in the, in the roadside and, you know, this informal markets, you can see a lot of so-called because they are not so much affected by those uh, other rules to which uh, certain big sector plays. Hmm? So this is, these are the three important points that we put into consideration. Now, when you look into your textbook, they will tell you that there are four basic types of market structures. Uh, there's monopolistic competition, there's perfect competition, there's monopoly, and there is oligopoly. Hmm? And I'm sure many of your lecturers have told you this. So we'll go quickly over this. So when you look at this structure, they say it, uh, when you talk about perfect competition in terms of market characteristics, there are very large numbers of small uh, relatively small companies or firms, and their products are more or less standardized. Why they're standardized? Because the price will be more or less the same. Huh? Everywhere you go, you find the same price of the same product. The color may differ. Uh, so differentiation is very, very small, not so much. And it is very easy to enter the market and exit it. Uh, you can easily enter. And it is very difficult to have non-price competition. In other words, what are non-price competition? Things like promotion, advertisement. If you advertise so much, you cannot really you know, uh, create differences in the market. Huh? Um, so what about the key indicators? They said they don't have market power because everybody's almost the same. And then uh, the long run competition or economic profit is none because these are guys who are short-term. Now the monopolistic competition, 
these are large number of relatively small farms, but their products are differentiated. Uh, you can see different. Uh, you find things like hand fonts, uh, sets, uh, companies, uh, and it is very easy to enter the market. Uh, and it's possible to have, uh, you know, non-price competition in this market. And the third one is oligopoly, uh, which are small number, but relatively large farms. Uh, the oil companies, uh, a group of these uh, companies, their products are standardized, but it's very difficult to enter this market because you need to be part of that company to enter this market. And then it is possible or difficult to have uh, non-price uh, uh, competition. And finally, of course, many of you know a monopoly is one. And mostly in our countries, we have utility companies, you have telecommunication companies. And in fact, government is also considered as uh, a monopoly. Uh, so this is the characteristics. But today, if you see, uh, uh, which uh, companies are dominant, although they say there is perfect competition, but you'll find around the world that many of the companies are in these two or three areas. Either they're monopoly, or they become oligopoly, or they become monopolistic uh, to a great extent. Uh, and so later we'll see that although perfect competition is ideal, and you will have to tell me whether perfect competition is really perfect. So I'll be focusing now on this perfect uh, competition. Uh, please let me know if I'm very fast or I'm going too fast uh, or I'm too slow. Let me know. Huh? Sorry, from time to time I'll be drinking something because here it's very cold. So sometimes <laughs> uh, it becomes dry huh? in our throat. Okay. Now, we look at uh, the market structure, which uh, Brother Imam uh, just talked about, about the so-called perfect competitive market. Now, many people uh, sometimes misunderstand the word perfect. Hmm? In the normal language, uh, common language, when you say perfect, it means something without fault, something without mistake, it's called perfect. Hmm? But in the economics jargon, perfect here means just and fair. That means competition in the market will be just and fair. And for this competition to be just and fair, you need to have these assumptions. Now, what are assumptions? Assumptions are part of the truth, part of the reality. Uh, let's say students are absent from class. Uh, what could be the reason why they are absent from class? Maybe their internet connection is not good. This is one. Uh, or maybe they are caught up in a traffic jam. This could be true. Or they have urgent things to attend is also true. So if you take only one part of these truth, uh, you said, assuming the students have no internet connection, then you make an analysis. So this assumption becomes part of the truth hmm? uh, of the entire you know, truth in economics. So what are the assumptions that we have to make for the market to be just and fair? They said one of the assumption is there are so many buyers and sellers in the market because if you have so many buyers and sellers, it becomes very difficult to influence prices. Hmm? And if you have only one seller, then there's a problem because the seller will dictate the price. It's a monopoly. Then the second thing is the goods have to be homogeneous. They are standardized goods. So when they are standardized goods, it's very difficult for one person to sell a price above the other because these are similar goods. The third thing they said is free entry and exit, as we saw earlier. Uh, if you want to enter the market, you can enter freely and you want to exit the market, the market will you know, push you out if you don't, you're not competitive. And the fourth assumption they said is there's no uh, information asymmetry. And like in those who study fiqh, they call it jahala. There's no jahala. Uh, the information that uh, 
the seller knows, the buyers also knows. So they share the same information. And so competition will be perfect. And, you know, uh, so many buyers will know, you know, uh, which shop to go to because they have information, full information about what's happening in those products and shop. So by this way, once these assumptions are all maintained, then the market is perfect. Therefore, there's no need for the government to interfere in the market. The market will operate nicely. So I'm giving you just a background of those markets. Later, we'll look at the Islamic perspective huh, of those uh, assumptions in market. So they said, once these assumptions are fulfilled, then the market just need to have a price signal. Uh, today, many of us, if we hear the word uh, uh, sale, 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 what is the first thing we look at? Uh, we look at the price. Oh. And if you want to go and have a house financing or oh, price, uh, we want to do this price. So price signal will be helping both the buyers and the sellers. So when the price is low, many buyers will come to buy that goods because uh, the quantity demanded of that good will go high. And this will give a signal to the seller that, oh, you see, uh, people want these goods. They want this baju kurung, not the other uh, shoes. So he will start producing more of the clothes. And so the price will be helping to allocate resources uh, between the buyers and the sellers. But also for this to happen, there has to be a kind of rationality. Eh? And many of you know in economics, the theory of rationality, both the buyers and the sellers have to be rational eh? in their thinking. Eh? So because of the time constraint, I will not go in detail into rationality, but I will move uh, quickly to the next uh, stage eh? so that later we give time for uh, interaction. Eh? So therefore, with the price signal, uh, with the assumptions, then the market should be able to work automatically. Huh? It will be able to regulate itself. Uh, so in our case here, we have a quantity of gasoline. Um, you see, it is sold at US $1.40. Uh, $1 and then the market should be able to sell around 600 uh, a million gallons of, uh, mm. of gasoline. And if for any other reason, the price goes high to 180, there will be excess surplus. And this will put pressure on the uh, demand and put pressure also on the supply. So uh, slowly by slowly, the price will come down uh, to 140. And likewise, also, if the price goes down, there will be excess demand and the sellers will not want to produce more. So again, this will put pressure on the demand and the equilibrium price will be realized. And so that was the assumption before 1929 that the market will operate freely. But in 1929, they realized that this thing doesn't work this way because there was a great depression. The sellers want to sell their goods, they could not sell. The buyers wanted to buy, they could not buy. Now what happens? They realize that you cannot, you know, eliminate the role of the government in the economy. Uh, the government has to come in. So people like Keynes, they suggested that you need the government to come in to absorb those excess supply in the market. And so from 1929, there is a recognition that the government has a role to play in the market. Apart from regulating the market, they can also play that role. So we give this background of the conventional. Now let us move and also look at the other dimension from now Islamic perspective. Now, the first thing is uh, when we look at these assumptions of the so-called perfect competition, all these four assumptions seems to be unrealistic in the first place. Why? Because take, for example, number three, free entry and exit. Look at the global level, particularly those who advocate free market. Do you think they allow you to enter their market freely? 
why do they impose sanction on, for example, certain quotas for China? You cannot export this. Why are they telling Malaysia, for example, you see your goods you are producing because of uh, you know, uh, uh, labor issues. Huh? So they bring in non-trade issues to impose restrictions on trade. And this is everywhere now you find in the uh, so-called Western world where there is a restriction. Even at the WTO level, you allow mobility of capital, but you don't allow mobility of labor. Huh? And yet you say there is free entry and exit. Huh? So in real, uh, in real life, it doesn't exist. Those assumptions only exist in the paper. Hmm? And you say no information asymmetry. That the same information that the buyer knows is the same information that the seller knows. But in reality, it's not true. Huh? Uh, otherwise, the issue of um, uh, moral hazards, uh, the issue of adverse selection in the uh, in the market will not allow, will not occur because these things occur because uh, there is no uh, uh, you call it uh, there is information asymmetry um, in most cases um, uh, the issue of uh, agency uh, agency problem occurs uh, even in normal life when we go to buy things it is not true that. Um, we know the product more than the seller. Huh? That's why in most cases, sometimes people get cheated because uh, you don't have full information about the product. Hmm? And so in real life also, to say there is uh, um, no information asymmetry may not also hold true. The same also applied to homogeneous goods. And as we saw earlier, that many of the companies today uh, either monopolistic or oligopoly or basically monopoly. Now, even if we assume that these assumptions are true, still the market will not be perfect. Why? Because the ethical dimensions are not included. And we saw in 2007 and 2008 financial crisis, many studies have shown that what brought about that crisis is ethical issues. I mean, these crises were brought about by ethical issues. And at the top of those issues are greed. People were greedy. Huh? And, uh, and people had no heart you know, to, to, to look at the situation of the poor. Uh, you go and take advantage of the poor, give them subprime loan. You had the collateralized debts. So you had a lot of issues that were related to ethics. To the extent that we had one Harvard professor, and many of you know that Harvard is uh, ranked as uh, the top university. So this uh, professor, Louis, uh, he wrote a very interesting book uh, called Excellence Without Soul. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, you can even Google Professor. Professor Google, you just says Excellence Without Soul. He will give you that, um, uh, that book. Uh, but in the introduction of the book, I like it. Professor Lewis, who was the dean of the business school, he says, very interestingly, that whenever we come to class, we teach our students how to be good managers. We tell them how to be good technicians, good engineers, etc. But he says, we hardly tell them how to be good people. We hardly tell them how to be ethical. And so he says, we are excellent university, but without soul. And that's very interesting, which shows that the ethical dimensions, once they miss uh, within our markets, within our education system, it creates that kind of distortion that we have in the market. Therefore, from an Islamic perspective, the market cannot be perfect if there's a riba. The market cannot be perfect if there's a gharar. The market cannot be perfect if there's maisir. So those ethical dimensions have to be considered when we discuss those assumptions.
Now, the other interesting part, which also this market assumes, is the idea of perfect competition. Now, when you look at the, 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 the literature from those perspective, the competition is always a, a throat, uh, a throat cutting competition. Uh, and from an Islamic perspective, we talk about competition with cooperation. Let me give you a story just to drive home my point. Uh, there was a gentleman who was working in UK, United Kingdom. Uh, he's a very good manager. So there is a perfume company in Saudi Arabia. It's a very big company in Mecca. Uh, so this brother, uh, alhamdulillah, he became you know, a Muslim. And uh, so he thought of working in the Gulf. Hmm? So they told him, okay, brother, you can come and work with us in Mecca as a manager to this uh, uh, big uh, perfume company. So this guy came and he was very, very happy to work. So as soon as he started working in that perfume company, then there came a competitor, their neighbor. They started constructing a house, uh, sorry, constructing a building, a shopping complex next to them, also to sell perfume. So then he inquired and asked from uh, the people around him that, our neighbors, our competitors, what's their job? He says, well, they're also having a, they're going to construct a shop, hmm? a, a complex for selling perfume. Then he thought, well, these guys, uh, when they become a competitor, then it will be another problem for us. This is what he was thinking. Then the boss, the sheikh of the company, the big boss, the Saudi sheikh, told the manager that, uh, Brother, you try to help our neighbor, give them food. Uh, if the constructors need something, please help them. Uh, anything they need, please give it to them. So this guy became surprised. How this sheikh is behaving this way? This is our competitor and is helping this competitor. Tomorrow, this competitor will compete with us. Why should he help? Anyway, he listened to the boss, started helping these people. So the building was up and the business started running. Then their competitor ran into debt, huge debt. So it started affecting their business. So again, the sheikh called the manager and said, come here, please. Uh, can you settle their debt and just settle their debt, let them run their business? So this guy from UK could not take it anymore. He says, sheikh, can I talk to you? He says, yes. Says, you see, where I come from, we don't do business this way. He says, why? He says, when our competitor is going off the market, we are very happy because the market is left for us. <laughs> then the sheikh told him, says, yeah, brother, but from an Islamic perspective, we don't do it this way. Because the first belief we have is that the risk comes from Allah. Uh, it doesn't come from us. Allah gives him his risk, gives us our risk. And whatever Allah gives us, he will not stop it. On the contrary, Allah will give us more if we help him. If we cooperate in our competition, our risk will be more. Uh, he will help him. That's a very interesting you know, perspective of uh, you know, uh, a competition that uh, we see within our you know, Islamic paradigm. Uh, in the early days of Islam, subhanAllah, uh, when one person comes and buy from one shop, then the next customer that comes, the shopkeeper will push him to the next shop to buy. The third one that comes, they will ensure that all the shops first have one customer, only then they begin. And this is a kind of a competition if you want to call it perfect competition, then we will call it competition with cooperation because our strong belief that al arza comes from Allah, one. Secondly, by helping one another, Allah will help all of us to grow. And so this makes it a very interesting, you know, uh, uh, perspective on what we mean by competition and cooperation from an Islamic uh, perspective. Now, 
by ignoring those uh, ethical values uh, like riba, uh, like uh, gharar, and looking at other externalities, uh, factors like uh, pollution, and also we have bigger issues related to economic agents like um, like um, just just one second huh, brother imam just one second yeah okay Sorry, there was uh, a phone call in the background, which was disturbing me, sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, what are those things that create market failures? Uh, we have things like, um, you know, uh, when we ignore those ethical values, uh, we have things like externalities, we are talking about negative externalities and things like uh, corruption, unfortunately and all the things that create some kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, create a kind of imbalance between private goals and social goals or societal goals, uh, they lead to market uh, uh, failures. Uh, they lead to market failures. And so therefore, today, the so-called perfect uh, competition, and many of you read that there are a lot of uh, market failures, and um, believe me or not, these market failures are largely caused by ignoring those ethical values much more than the so-called externalities. Uh, I take RIBA, for example, RIBA as an example. <clears throat> uh, look at the debt, indebtedness of several countries in the world today, particularly the least developed countries see the huge amount of interest rate that they have to finance. And worse still, worse still, because their rating is very low, they are rated very low in their credit standing. So the amount of interest charged on their loan is much more higher than the rich countries, which are rated very highly. And these guys are more in need of funds uh, Indonesia may be much more in need of funds than let's say Singapore, for example. But because Singapore credit is rated high, then you find that the amount of, you know, uh, interest charge on debts on Indonesia is high. Uh, so, and worse still maybe also in most of our third world countries. And um, one person was citing a very interesting case where one country, uh, in Africa, Congo had to borrow 500 million, but to pay back, they have to pay 5 billion. Uh, you can imagine, you borrow 500 million, you pay 5 billion. Now, how do you expect the market to function properly? How do you expect those situation to work when we have just only this element, riba? Riba alone distorts the entire market. Hmm? So we cannot have a perfect market unless uh, these elements are eliminated uh, from the market. So moving forward, the other thing that we see is also uh, this um, so-called, uh, uh, another perspective market structure. And many of you know that at a practical level, we have a third market structure, a third market called the financial markets. If you look from my diagram here, I hope the cursor is showing. Uh, let us look on the left side here. When companies wants to produce goods, and this company means it could be business, it could be government, uh, they want to produce goods. Uh, they will go to the financial markets, uh, the financial markets to get capital. Mm -hmm. So once they get capital from the financial market, they will come and source for the factor markets. 
they will source for goods, uh, for inputs, machineries, labor, etc. Once they get the productive service, they will produce the goods, sell it in the product market, their goods and services. They get the payment and then pay back to the financial sector. Likewise, these guys, uh, what normally they do is that uh, uh, sometimes some of the goods and services they need may be beyond their ability. So again, they will go to the financial markets. They will give them houses, give them cars. So they go and buy it from the product market. Once they buy, with the little money that they get, they pay some and some of them, they pay it in the financial markets. So what you see happening today, Islamically speaking, these two products, product market and factor markets, these two markets were supposed to dictate the needs of the society. Uh, but what you see happening today is that it is this financial market that dictate the needs of the product market and the factor market. If companies want to produce, for example, and the interest rate is high, then there's a problem already compromise on their production capacity. Likewise, how many people today are able to afford houses? How many people are able to afford cars? Huh? Because the interest rates dictate, and the poorer you are, the more higher interest rate you have to pay for those financing. And unfortunately today, the degree of indebtedness is dictated by this market. And the volume of trade in the financial markets is 800 times much more than the product markets and the factor markets. Mm. Uh, that is why this, uh, uh, this uh, American, uh, what do you call it, candidate, president candidate, uh, Sanders, when he was passing through the uh, Wall Street, he says, the entire American economy is confined to the Wall Street, uh, more than 30 trillion uh, US dollars. Mm. So it is this market that is dictating to us while it should have been the other way around. Mm. Now, finally, this is the kind of a structure that we are looking at mm. when you talk about uh, an Islamic uh, structure in the future. Uh, where we need to have the role of the third sector, which is our zakah and our waqaf. I'm very, very happy really to read that Indonesia is making a lot of progress in this area. Mm -hmm. And to see that, uh, for example, the sukuk structure in Indonesia, waqaf sukuk, is now tied not only to the banking sector, but it's also connected to the real sector. And so I think this is actually a way uh, forward, a way forward where we need the third sector also to play a role in the, in the economy. Uh, but as it is now, our challenge is that even the third sector still uh, is being dictated by the rule of the private sector, the rule of the private sector. So far, an Islamic market to emerge uh, properly, uh, we need to curve distinct, you know, distinct rules for each of these sector, uh, the public sector, the private sector, and then we need the third sector to grow uh, because it is the third, third sector that will in future support uh, all those uh, sectors. Uh, um, and we saw in the Ottoman uh, period, how much a huge part of the government, uh, you know, the public sector spending was supported by the third sector, which also give relief to the private sector to focus uh, on providing business uh, activities. Huh? So this is something which we have to look at and think forward. Hmm? Now, I'm left with another uh, 20 plus minutes, so I'll move quickly. Now, what's the role of the government? Uh, theoretically, in an Islamic perspective, um, that the government is part and parcel uh, of the system. Uh, 
Uh, uh, because if we remember very well in our history, there is something called al hizba hmm? the Hizbah institution uh, by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And now this al hizba we have several ministries, but I don't know to what extent our ministry play the role of al hizba hmm? uh, because uh, what al hizba used to do, SubhanAllah, is to ensure uh, that the real industry is provided in the market. Uh, they ensure that the minimum wage, uh, which is a very critical issue today. Everybody is discussing about the minimum wage. But during the early days uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions, the issue of wage was very paramount, uh, being emphasized uh, that people earn what they deserve. Mm -hmm. And then not only that, there was also the issue of eliminating negative elements in the market. Uh, things like gharar, things like riba. And many of you can remember in one instance where the Prophet Sallallahu came in the market, uh, he dipped his hands in a grain and uh, the grain was uh, dry on top, but in the bottom it was wet. Then he asked the man, he says, um, uh, what happened to this grain? He says, Ya Rasulullah, it was rain, uh, which affected my grains. Then he says, why don't you put the defects so that people know that the grain at the bottom is wet? Why do you beautify it with uh, the dry grain on top while at the bottom, uh, the grain is not good. So he says, whoever deceives is not among us. So the al hizba used to ensure there's no deception in the market. Uh, there's no, you know, um, deceit in the market. There's no fraud. Uh, there's no gharar. All these elements are eliminated. On the contrary, they used to encourage positive values. Uh, the values of sharing, uh, the values of caring in the market. And uh, so those were very, very fundamental to ensure that uh, the, the, the competition in the market is, is really perfect huh, in our real sense uh, that we talk about. <clears throat> now, there are other dimensions also which are affecting our market today. Hmm? The issue of halal and haram. Hmm? Uh, and I think these are very, very, very important. Uh, not only in services, but also in real goods and services, mm? yeah, in real goods. Now, I have here two edge, huh? uh, and in this edge, you find it's the gap between the two edges is very small. But here you have the gap is very big. Mm? Now, the Prophet وسلم, says in the hadith that in al halal bayin, that halal is clear. وإن الحرام بين and haram is clear وبينهما أمور مشتبهات and between this halal and haram is gray area لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس many people are unaware of these gray areas so as time goes by may Allah save our gray areas are becoming bigger and bigger not only in terms of the goods that we consume, the goods that we sell, but in terms of our dealings also in the market. So if you're talking about real imperfection in an Islamic market, it is these gray areas that we bring in the market. Whether you're talking about our product market, you're talking about our subhanAllah factor market, and you're talking about our financial markets. And it is even more in the financial markets that we have a lot of gray areas. Hmm? Uh, some of them we created ourselves through heal, through a lot of legal devices. And some of it we created through, you know, deceit, fraud, etc. So anything doubtful at the time of the Prophet وسلم, they avoid it. But today we try to justify doubts in our own way. Therefore, we create imperfection in the market because of this kind of uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other second interesting thing is our indulgence into a tarf, 
Hmm? And this also impact in our wealth and income distribution. What do we mean by a tarf? A tarf is when, subhanAllah, um, we do excessive, uh, excessive luxury. Uh, Islam is not against the creation. Islam is not against luxury. In fact, in Maqasid al-Sharia, we have those three levels of daruriyat, hajiyat, and tahsiniyat. Hmm? Uh, we can have it. But when it goes excessive, uh, like it was reported that one prince in a Muslim world, he has 35 bedrooms. Each bedroom has four bathrooms. And the you know, toilet seat in each bathroom is made of gold. So if you have this kind of a situation, then this becomes a tarf. Uh, and we know so why a tarf is not allowed. If you have so many people creating tarf, then you create imperfection in the market because there will be a problem of income and wealth distribution, a problem of resource allocation. And then again, we have a problem of uh, imperfection in the market. The other interesting thing we look at is, uh, which we also create in the market, is the idea of al-israf and tabdir. And uh, it's even more on tabdir, which I will say later. What is israf? Israf is um, where the thing that we consume is halal. We consume halal things, but we go excessive in our consumption or we go excessive in our spending. So this becomes israf, and Allah does not like those who do israf. Now, what is the impact of israf? Uh, you have a lot of impact. For example, for countries that import, hmm, uh, if you import in excess of the needs of the people, and in some countries it even goes to 2 billion uh, US dollars in excess, just on Israf, for this thing to be thrown away. And studies show that more than 80% of what we throw are food stuff. Hmm, at a situation when we should be uh, taking care of this israf. And now, but today, alhamdulillah, there's another branch of economics called uh, a circular economy. And I think um, this is also gaining currency among the Muslims, where some of those waste are recycled back into the system. Some good ones are used as fertilizers and uh, some of them are recycled into producing new products. So I think that that's an area which we should be looking at. Uh, if you don't recycle them at home and you cycle them outside, and uh, I'm sure uh, Indonesia is also, is very good at that, producing a lot of byproducts. Huh? When I came to Indonesia, I see the kind of kue kue. Huh? From one rice, they can produce how many how many we are, the same also we see in, in, in Malaysia. Hmm? Uh, so the other element is a tabdir. Huh? What's a tabdir? A tabdir is when you spend on something what? <laughs> Which uh, is not required. Take the case of cigarettes. Believe me or not, this is, I will call it double tabdir or even triple tabdir. Why? Because when people spend, see the impact on their health. One of the Muslim government had to spend $300 million just to treat people who are smoking. Why do we have to spend that $300 million on tabdir when the Sharia tells you there is no need for it? You are destroying your life, destroying others. In fact, in terms of Sharia, things like smoking becomes haram because uh, the Prophet وسلم, says that la darar wa la dirar. don't do harm to yourself and do harm to others. So for those who are still indulged into smoking, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help them because it also is a distortion, actually, a distortion of the market because as we saw earlier, in al hisbah during the time of the Prophet وسلم, they ensure that the goods provided in the market are goods that are related to the needs of the people. Yes, the government may be getting taxes, but at what expense? 
at the expenses of the life of the people, at the expenses of their health. And in the long run, there is no win-win situation. So uh, we have to ensure that uh, this health of the people are taken care of and we avoid this issue of uh, at the I'm just left with uh, five minutes, inshallah, I'll be wrapping in these five minutes. So finally, uh, we come to a conclusion of what we have discussed <clears throat> earlier, just within these five minutes. Uh, to begin with, we had said that um, the perfect competition, which uh, uh, is advocated by the so-called neoclassical economics, which is a dominant actually system today. Uh, most of the assumptions of these so-called fair markets uh, do not hold true. And secondly, those assumptions exclude ethical values. And once you exclude those ethical values, which are very fundamental uh, to the working of a perfect market, then the market can never be perfect. And we have seen how just by having an interest-based system, uh, we have a lot of uh, problems with resource allocations. We have a lot of problems with the income and wealth distribution across the world. We have wealth concentration in the hands of the few because riba or interest by design transfers wealth from the poor and give them uh, to the rich. On the contrary, a zakah <coughs> transfers wealth from the poor, sorry, from the rich to the poor. <clears throat> the other second important point is the role of the government uh, is very paramount mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, there is um, uh, harmony <coughs> between private and uh, public goals. <clears throat> so the government does not only ensure that there is good functioning of the market, uh, but they also help to provide the necessary support to ensure that uh, the market runs perfectly. And the third point is very fundamental, <clears throat> which we have to look at it in the future. Now, how do we strive to develop the so-called Islamic markets. I think the first thing is we need to begin by changing our mindsets. Uh, today, many of us operate in what we call dualistic mindset. <clears throat> uh, in the masjid, we behave differently. Once we go out of the masjid, we are different people. Uh, in certain situations, we behave uh, you know, differently. At home, we are different. Outside home, we are different. So we need to get rid of this dualism. <clears throat> when we go to uh, our markets, hmm, uh, whether you're talking about finance market, you talk about product markets, labor market, we don't ask the tough questions. Hmm. The first thing we ask usually is price, price, price. That means we are driven by the price signal. Um, but uh, price signal is important, yes, but for a Muslim, more important is the values. Mm? Uh, you cannot buy something haram, however cheap it is. <clears throat> so those ethical uh, dimension uh, that constrain your, your decisions are very, very important. That we need to look at... Uh, those ethical dimensions. In other words, the awareness about uh, what is Islamic becomes very paramount to both the sellers and the buyers. Uh, the second thing that we need to look at is our institutions. <clears throat> uh, so how do we evolve an institution that will not only educate uh, the economic agents in the market, uh, but at the same time, it will uphold those values and principles uh, that we are trying to promote. <clears throat> and to my mind, I think a few things are very, very important. Uh, we need to run a parallel system eh, at the moment. Uh, like we see, uh, you know, Islamic uh, microfinance coming up. 
Uh, we see cooperative uh, uh, finances coming up. Now with the development of the FinTech, uh, which is, is, is very interesting for us because it's a disruptive uh, kind of a technology where we can do a lot of things which uh, we cannot do in the system. So by having uh, the FinTech ecosystem, and which uh, I'm very happy uh, looking at uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Turkey, and most Muslim countries. Uh, now people are adopting this uh, FinTech wave. Mm? Uh, crowdfunding is already you know, uh, developing faster. <clears throat> we see uh, digitization of a lot of activities. And even our Zaka uh, uh, functions, we see uh, those digital functions also coming in. So those digitalization or digital transformation give us a degree of independence uh, from the system. And so once we have independence, then we can be able to infuse our Islamic values uh, properly and thereby ensure that we have a perfect competitive market with cooperation as Islam requires us to do. Jazakum Allah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Now I'll wait for uh, your comments and questions and answers. <coughs> okay. uh, thank you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Mustafa Ammar Muhammad, about uh, very nice presentations, yeah? the topics, uh, market structure in Islamic perspective. Okay, uh, now... We, uh, we provide the Q&A sessions, maybe uh, other the participant will give the questions. This one, one questions, yeah. Okay, uh, Prof. Mustafa Amar Muhammad, yeah. yeah. I will give you two questions, yeah. yeah. The first, yeah, that the characteristic in the monopolistic competitions, uh, there are the innovations and promotions. Yeah, innovation and promotion. Could you please, could you please explain about the characteristic in Islamic perspective? Okay. And number two, uh, how about the role of money? Yeah. How about the role of money in the Islamic perspective? Uh, in the in the competitions in, in the market. Okay, thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> yeah. You see, when usually you are an imam, you ask very mm -hmm. tough questions. Huh? Uh, question, this question is not for mamum like us, but thank you very much. I think it's, uh, uh, first of all, <clears throat> I think the uh, we have to differentiate between concepts and practice. Hmm? Uh, for example, the word monopoly as a concept is not un-Islamic. Uh, the word monopolistic as a concept is not un-Islamic. <clears throat> it is how you do, how you behave in that concept. You may be a monopolist, but you can be a very good monopolist by having price discrimination, uh, meaning you give different prices to different sector, different people, and it works well. Hmm? And you could have monopolistic competition uh, based on the, the nature of the firms uh, and the nature of your products. But again, the way you do your pricing, although you are defined as monopolistic in that category, but the impact of masla, how you give to the society and how you do it becomes Islamic. <clears throat> so to me, we have to differentiate between the concept and uh, the practice. Therefore, if you have a kind of a promotion and innovation, uh, innovation is highly encouraged. And that's a good term, your word you use now. Innovation is encouraged uh, in the market. But then the promotion has to be ethical, hmm? uh, the way you promote. Because we see in some situation where the promotions are not ethical, huh? either in terms of the images put or in terms of the messages being sent, huh? Uh, some of those messages becomes um, uh, unethical. It doesn't go in line with our uh, our dean or the way we do it. Huh? Uh, sometimes you promote something as part of the price, but you let it look as if it's a gift. It's not part of the price. Hmm? So there are a lot of things in, in promotion <laughs> that you need uh, uh, 
uh, people to come in and check and say, okay, uh, is this uh, Islamic or uh, un-Islamic? So basically this is for the first uh, question. Uh, for the second question, which is a very interesting question where everybody is talking about it, <clears throat> uh, the role of money in the, uh, in the economy. <clears throat> Now, money is supposed to be uh, a medium of exchange and uh, money is supposed to fulfill the needs of the people. So many of our scholars have differed on uh, the kind of money that we use. Mm -hmm. And some have been talking about, uh, you know, uh, gold and silver. Uh, some have been talking about uh, paper money. Some have been talking about even a lot of other <clears throat> rocks, etc., were used as money uh, previously. But one of the characteristics of money is what is agreed upon. This is one. And to add more from a Makassid perspective is money that fulfills the needs of the people and money that cannot be easily manipulated. Mm -hmm. And so when people begin to manipulate money, and then uh, money does not serve uh, you know, the interests of the people, then it becomes uh, a problem. <clears throat> now, today, many of us know that um, <clears throat> our money works within the fractional reserve system. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, because of the nature of the money that we have in the fractional reserve system, then we create credit uh, uh, in the system and we tend to create a lot of debt in the system. Even electronically now, we have electronic money and we create system. And now if this form of money are used to facilitate buying and selling, uh, there's no problem uh, uh, as a medium of exchange. But to me, the worries is if money becomes uh, as a form of creating debt in the economy, uh, creating burden to the people, then I think the function of become, money becomes <clears throat> very, very, very difficult. And finally, there is that discussion of the intrinsic value of money. Mm -hmm. um, and here, uh, the issue of inflation comes. Huh? Uh, and if you see today also the direction is that many countries are beginning to save gold, huh? <clears throat> gold reserves. Mm -hmm. And uh, US has huge uh, gold reserves, China, and we also see Turkey among the Muslim countries also trying to compile gold as a reserve. So my view is that um, while we deal with other forms of money, we must also have a kind of a reserve hmm, uh, to back those money like uh, gold. Huh? That will be my, my suggestion. Have I answered your question? I don't know whether that was what you're asking about. Is it a monetary policy or just the role of money? Huh? Okay. Okay. Brother and sister, do you have any questions? Maybe. Okay, I think it's enough. In the lectures, and thank you very much, uh, Prof. Mustafa Omar Muhammad, that today uh, can deliver the very nice presentations, very nice course. Uh, the topic about the market structures in Islamic perspective, inshallah, yeah, uh, all of students can understand and implement it yeah, economic activity. Okay. Uh, First of all, uh, on behalf of the Department of Economics, I uh, give thank you very much for all of Mustafa Muhammad. And please, we close our meeting today by pre Kafaratul Majlis and Hamdallah. Thank you.
Aksennya gimana, Pak? Salam, Pak. Dan...